H. Richard Niebuhr was a 20th century neo-Orthodox ethicist. And he wrote a book to try to assess the movement of theological liberalism in America from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. And in that book, he summarizes the teaching of theological liberalism by acknowledging that what liberalism teaches is this. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Niebuhr recognized the bankruptcy of theological liberalism. He identified its failures to believe core teachings of the scripture, key elements of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The proponents of theological liberalism emphasize the teachings and character of Jesus and they downplay his crucifixion. What really matters to them and what they say should matter to us is the life of Jesus and the example that he gives to us of being loving, and kind, and generous. And of course, Jesus was all of those things, but that is not all that Jesus was and certainly not all that he did. So the proponents of liberalism teach that the kingdom of Christ is a kingdom of love with no judgment. I mean, after all, judgment is harsh and judgment tends to make people nervous and even feel bad. And gentle Jesus, meek and mild, would never want to make anyone feel bad. Furthermore, if the kingdom of God is a no judgment zone, then They don't want us to hang on to the notion that people are inherently sinful. To think about people being sinful by nature is, as one liberal theologian told me years ago, terribly medieval. And we've advanced beyond that. So they reason like this. While men and women are not perfect, They do occasionally make mistakes. We shouldn't talk about them as sinners. We certainly shouldn't try to help anyone conceive of himself or herself as a sinner. That's degrading. So away with the idea that God is a God of wrath against sin. If you don't do that, then you're proclaiming a religion that is repulsive. Theological liberalism completely reimagines God as a kindly, benevolent being who does nothing but indulge the creatures that he made in his image. So Niebuhr's description of liberal theology is very accurate. It is a God without wrath bringing men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. But this is exactly why another Orthodox theologian in the 20th century, J. Gresham Machen, said liberalism, theological liberalism, is not just another version of Christianity. It is a completely different religion altogether. If you reject what the Bible has to say about wrath and judgment and sin and the cross, then you are rejecting true Christianity. You are rejecting the gospel that has been revealed to us in Scripture. The only message of salvation. The only way that people like you and me can ever be made right with God. And so while you might think that you're doing good by downplaying or rejecting these hard edges of revealed truth, in reality you're being cruel because you keep people from the truth. The only truth that can set them free. The Apostle Paul knew this and explains why he went to such lengths to explain and defend the gospel. He gave his life to see people reconciled to their creator. He gave his life to proclaiming the forgiveness of sins that is available in Jesus Christ. To show people what God has revealed about his grace and his mercy toward sinners. We see this particularly in the letter that he wrote to the church at Rome where we have the closest thing to a systematic presentation of the Apostle Paul's understanding of God's way of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
after explaining the universality and seriousness of sin in the first part of that letter, especially chapter 1 verse 18 through chapter 3 verse 20, Paul takes up the question of how our holy God could ever forgive and accept sinners into His presence. It is a dilemma. I mean, how can God be holy, so holy that He he can't countenance sin in any way, and yet still receive sinners to Himself? How can He do that? Well, the answer, as Paul explains it, is found in what we call the doctrine of justification. It is through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. When when a person trusts Christ, then the righteousness that Christ earned gets credited to that person. And the death that Christ died for sin also gets credited to that person. And so now the person through faith in Christ is accepted as righteous in God's sight, And has all of his sins paid for forever. Paul says God does that for ungodly people. The ungodly people who turn from sin and trust Jesus can be sure that God credits the life and death of Jesus to their account. That is, that God justifies them. So to summarize the Bible's teaching about justification by faith, we put it like this. The justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There's no other way. Not anything you do, not anything you earn, not any other place you can go in order for God to justify you. The Apostle Paul makes this case in Romans from chapter 3 verse 21 all the way down to the end of chapter 4. And then beginning in chapter 5, He starts drawing out some of the implications of justification by grace through faith in Christ. And what he shows us in the first 11 verses of chapter 5 is that the justified life is a life that is rich in joyful hope. We've been looking at this passage now for two previous studies. This is our third study in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. And we return to it today and I encourage you to get a copy of God's Word in front of you. If you're using one of the Bibles that's found in the chair in front of you, it's on page 942. And I want to remind you that I identified six blessings, six implications of the justified life that we find in these 11 verses. We've already looked at the first four. Verse 1 speaks of peace that we have with God. Verse 2, we have a standing in grace, the End of verse 2, that we have joy in the hope of the glory of God. Verses 3 through the first part of verse 5, we have joy in sufferings. And today, we want to look at the last two of these six implications of the justified life. Specifically in verses 9 and 10, salvation from wrath. Verse 11, joy in God. So let's look at this passage again, especially focusing in on verses 9, 10, and 11 as we hear what God says to us about the implications of being justified by grace through faith in Christ. Let me read the whole passage for us, get it before our thinking again, but pay particular attention to these last three verses. Romans 5, verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
In those last three verses, Paul teaches that because we have been justified before God, we will be saved from the wrath of God. That's verses 9 and 10. Did you hear the the logical thinking of the Apostle Paul? I pointed that out before, but we're going to see it again in these last three verses. But just note again the way Paul reasons. He, He reasons. He's making a case. And he wants us to believe something. He wants to move us in our thinking and in our affections and in the way that we choose to live. So in verse 1, it's therefore, therefore, what he's about to write is based upon the whole premise of being justified by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Because that is true. And if you are in Christ and you're justified, these things are also true. You look at verse 3, he says, not only that, so he's building upon the immediately prior stated blessings of justification. In verses 6 and 7, both of those verses start with the little word for. For. You see what he's doing? He's arguing. He's making a case. He wants us to understand and believe something. We see the same approach in verse 9. You see how it starts as he lays out the premise of his point that we will be saved from the wrath of God. He says, since therefore. Since, in other words, Christ died for us, as he's just written in verse 8. Since this is true, since we have now been justified by his blood. When Paul uses blood in this way, it's theological shorthand. It's a way that he refers to what happened on the cross. All of the historical realities surrounding the death of Jesus on the cross and all of the theological events and accomplishments that took place on the cross. So Paul says we've been justified by the death of Jesus on the cross. And that fact is the basis on which he makes this next point. Notice the way that Paul speaks of justification here in the light of how he's spoken of it Prior to this, in our study of Romans, for example, in chapter 3, verse 24, we read that we're justified by His grace. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, we have been justified by faith. And now here in verse 9, justified by His blood. You, you see what he's saying? It's, this is why we summarize it the way that we do. That justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because all of those elements are involved in how God can accept sinful people into his presence and indeed into his family. It's grace. It is because of Christ. And we get Christ not by doing, not by turning over new leaves but by believing, by trusting. This is vitally important teaching in the Scripture. There's, there's, if, if you miss this, it doesn't matter what you get in the Bible. Luther rightly said that this teaching about justification is the doctrine by which a church stands or it falls. You miss this, You can be right about everything else, and the church is going to fall. If you get this, then you can be wrong about some other things, and you will have the essence of the matter, the root of the matter in you, and you'll be able to stand. If you're going to have your sins forgiven, and you're going to be counted righteous in God's sight, then you're going to have to deal honestly with the reality that God made you for himself in his image, and you have rebelled against him. And your rebellion has separated you from God. And it incurs God's judgment, His wrath, that were He to be purely just and show no grace would be poured out upon you for all of eternity so that you might spend eternity paying for your sins. But if you renounce your sin, if you confess it, acknowledge that it's true, and bow to Christ as Lord and receive Christ as God's provision for sinners, then you will be justified in His sight. And if you've never been justified in the sight of God, if you have never been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus, friend, 
I'm so happy you're here today. God brought you here to, to be confronted with this truth from his word. And he calls you in his behalf. I call you right now where you are to turn from your sin and trust Jesus. Be reconciled to your creator. Don't go another moment without humbly acknowledging that, yes, it's true, and I need salvation, I need grace, I need righteousness, and God grants that in Christ. If you'll trust Christ, God will accept you, and you will find yourself justified now and forever. So the premise of Paul's argument in verse 9 is that Jesus has died for us, and we have been justified before God by his death. And since that is true, he goes on in the last part of verse 9, and he begins to make his argument. He says, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Much more. This is another logical uh, argument. It's another logical approach to the case that he's making. In fact, he uses this phrase much more four times in this chapter. We have it here in verse 9. We have it again in verse 10. We're going to see it in verse 15. And we're going to see it in verse 17. It's an argument that Paul is making from the greater to the lesser. He's establishing a greater truth, a greater point, so that a lesser point will be seen to be obvious. Oh, well, if this is true, then of course this has to be true. The point is that justified people do not have to fear God's wrath. Now, isn't that an amazing thought? Because God's wrath is a fearful thing. The author of Hebrews says our God is a consuming fire. We have evidences of God's wrath poured out throughout both Old and New Testaments. Where God displays His holiness, His righteousness. By giving us glimpses of his wrath. Sometimes people don't want to think about God's wrath. Or they want to downplay it. Or say, well, God's not like that. Because they misunderstand what God's wrath is. They think God's wrath is like human wrath. And we all know people who fly off the handle. We know people who are hotheads. And if you cross them a little bit, they just come at you with vengeance. Well, that's not God at all. God's wrath is never out of control. God's wrath is never inconsistent with His love and His mercy and His grace. Listen to the way that the late theologian John Murray explains it. God's wrath is the holy revulsion of God, God's being against that which is the contradiction of His holiness. So in a sense, it's reflexive. The fact that God is holy, inevitably, leads him to be a God of wrath. Wrath against all that is unholy. Did you know that the wrath of God is found over 200 times in the Old Testament? When you get to the Old Testament prophets, their speaking of God's wrath overwhelmingly has to do with the future. With a day that is yet to appear when God's wrath will be poured out in some great display on the earth. This is the meaning, part of the meaning behind the phrase, the day of the Lord. So, for example, in the prophet Zephaniah chapter 1, we read this, The great day of the Lord is near. It's near and it's hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Paul speaks about this too, no less than 18 times in his messages and his letters in the New Testament. He refers to the wrath of God. And at least 11 of those times, it's about the coming wrath of God. The wrath of God in the future that awaits being put on display. We've already seen this in Romans up to this point. If you look back at chapter 2, verse 5, what does Paul say? He says, it's because of your hard and impenitent heart that you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. There's a day of wrath coming. And here's Paul's point. Reasoning, helping us to think as we 
ought to think from the greater thing to the lesser thing. Since Christ justified us by his death, the greater thing. We were enemies. We were sinful. His son became man. And his son as the God-man hung upon the tree. Since God did that to justify us by the death of Christ, he will certainly save us from the coming day when his wrath will be poured out on the earth. The lesser thing. If he's already given up his son for slaughter on the cross to justify us, we can be sure that by the grace that is in his son, he will save us from the wrath that is to come. When a wildfire is spreading across a prairie, sometimes the best way to help fight that fire is by lighting a backfire. In other words, lighting a fire that's in the path of the wildfire. So that by the time the wildfire gets there, the fuel that it would normally consume to stay alive is gone. And it has to die or change directions because there's nothing left to burn. And those who would stand on that burned over area are safe. They can watch the wildfire coming and they can know that it can't touch them because they're standing on ground that is safe. In a similar way, that's exactly what God has done in Jesus on the cross. God poured out his wrath on his son on the cross. When his son took our sins upon himself and volunteered his life on the cross, God punished our sins by executing his son and putting his wrath upon our sins that his son was bearing in a way that the fire of his wrath burned the cross. And there's a day of wrath in the future coming. When God's wrath, like a wildfire, will come and be poured out on this earth. And the only safe place to stand is where His wrath has already burned once. It's the cross. The only place that you will find that is a place of safety, a place of of salvation, a place of security is on the ground of the cross. And the only way you get that is by faith. You trust Jesus Christ. You give yourself to Christ. You bow to Him as Lord. And in faith, you cling to Him. And as you cling to Christ, you can be sure that on the day of His wrath, when His wrath is unleashed like a wildfire across all of creation, you'll be saved. Because of Christ. Paul wants us to take great hope in that security. If you're in Christ, Christian, God's wrath has nothing to do with you. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation for you. If you're in Christ, you don't have to fear God coming to you in wrath to make you pay for your sin. Because Jesus Christ absorbed wrath that you deserve on the cross. But if you're not in Christ, if you're not trusting the Lord Jesus, be assured, there is a day coming. There's a day coming when God will bring history to an end. When He will wrap up History, like an old newspaper, and simply ignite it in order to make new heavens and new earth. And on that day of wrath, there will be no place for you to hide. And so the call, the plea, the provision for you today is to turn away from your sin and trust Christ. Be saved. From the wrath that is to come. Trust the Lord Jesus. Be reconciled to your creator. Find in Christ forgiveness of sins. Find in him acceptance with God. He will save you. That's why he sent his son. That's why he's given us this in the Bible. That's why this message from this portion of God's word today. Has been designed for us to hear at this time. So that you might be saved.
If you'll trust the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Well, after establishing the premise and then making his argument, Paul goes on in verse 10, and he gives us an explanation for his argument. And again, notice the logic. We see it in verse 10 again. Much more, much more, he says. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son, and we will have all that we need in that reconciliation to save us forever. To be reconciled is... It's closely related to being justified. Though reconciliation is a relational term and justification is a legal term. Justification is a legal declaration and the scene that it comes from is the courtroom. Reconciliation is a healing of relationships. It's a restoring of what has been broken and the scene is a family. And we have been reconciled, Paul says, to God by the death of of Jesus. In other words, Jesus, by what he did, has brought us near to God. We were far away from him because of sin. Jesus has come and he's bridged the gap between us and God. And by his life and death and resurrection, he has brought us back into relationship. He's restored us to God. And he did this for us while we were God's enemies. Did you see that? Enemies. We're called enemies. Why? Because that's our natural state as a result of sin. Again, people don't like to think of this. People like to think that they and God are on good terms. Don't tell me I'm an enemy of God or he's my enemy. We, we haven't argued. You know, I let God be God and he lets me be me and we get along okay. No, you don't. Listen to what God says about people by nature. Romans chapter 8 verse 7, Paul says, The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot Hostile, at enmity with God. Or as he puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath, just like the others. You don't get a pass because of your parents. You don't get a pass because of your good intentions. By nature, we are children of wrath. So Paul says in our text in verse 10, much more... Now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Again, from the greater to the lesser. The greater thing was to be reconciled by Christ's death while we were enemies. The lesser thing is now that we are reconciled to be saved by his life. That is, his life after his resurrection. It's who Jesus is now. What Jesus is doing now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty making intercession for us. I like the way the Princeton theologian Charles Hodge explains verse 10. He says, If while we were enemies, we were restored to the favor of God by the death of His Son, the fact that He lives will certainly secure our final salvation. Did you notice in this passage the the three tenses of salvation? The past, the present, and the future aspects of our salvation? I want to point them out to you. In the past tense, when we were enemies, we were reconciled. The past. The present tense, now that we are reconciled. And the future tense, we shall be saved by his life. This perfectly describes the salvation we have in Christ. We were saved. When God sent his son into the world and Jesus hung upon the cross and he said, it's finished. He saved his people from sin objectively by what he accomplished there. But we're now being saved when God comes to us by his spirit and makes the word alive in our thinking and turns us from sin and enables us to trust Christ. We are entering into present salvation that we now have. But brothers and sisters, we will be saved one day. We will be completely saved. The wrath of God will be removed from us Forever, we will not have to fear that wrath. God's wrath will come. It will not touch us. And we will be made complete, perfectly conformed to the image of His Son. We have been, we are being, and we shall be saved. When God justifies a sinner through faith, He declares that sinner righteous, accepted forever. So brothers and sisters, do not fear the wrath of God. It doesn't belong to you. The wrath that belonged to you has been absorbed by your Savior, the Lord Jesus, on the cross.
Well, that's the fifth blessing that we find in the passage from the justified life. It's we are saved from God's wrath. So let's now look now to the sixth blessing. Because we're justified, verse 11 says, we have joy in God. I love when way begins. More than that, it's, it's, like, it's like one of those late night commercials. But wait, there's more. <laughs> you know, here's, here's these great things, but there's more. There's more. More than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We rejoice. It's, it's not the typical word for joy. This is what we've seen already in verses 2 and 3. We, we boast. We exult. Um, we are filled with our affections being warmed toward God. Verse 2, we hope in the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in our sufferings. Here in verse 10, Paul emphasizes that we rejoice not simply in what God does, not simply in what God promises, but we rejoice in God. In God's person. In His being. We find joy in God. So, not only do we have nothing to fear concerning God's wrath, we have reasons to rejoice because of God. To desire Him. To delight in Him. To enjoy Him. Why? Because of what He, by grace, has done for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus, that we've come to know through faith. The reason we can rejoice in God, as Paul puts it here, is, it, is because we have this joy through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has reconciled us to God. Paul puts it like this. We have received reconciliation. We were estranged from God. Liable in danger to His wrath because of our sin. God sent His Son to take our place, to take His wrath upon Himself and to carry our sins away so that now there's nothing but peace between us and God. There is justification. There's reconciliation. And we can know our God as our Savior, Creator, as our Father. We've sung it. We must believe it. My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for His child. I can no longer fear. With confidence, I now draw nigh. And Father, Abba, Father. That's our cry. Brothers and sisters, because we have been justified, God has showered blessings upon us including the certainty of knowing His wrath will never have anything to do with us and the certainty of knowing that we can rejoice in God. We can delight in Him because He is our God and Father. Let's pray together.